Hello again, everyone. You're joining us for another episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint podcast series. My name is Jeff Mix. I'm head of content and research. My guest today is Andrew Knez of Covalent Networks. We're going to be having a conversation about uh, workforce training and development, how it's changing over time, what manufacturers need to know about what technology can do to help them out. Uh, I think this is going to be a terrific conversation. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me today. Jeff, thanks for having me. Why don't we start off with, um, I think, probably the biggest issue that I keep hearing in manufacturing over the last couple of years. There is high turnover on plant floors. There's, uh, you know, the boomers are finally retiring. A lot of institutional knowledge is going out the door. Some of the younger people who are coming in have to be brought up to speed very quickly. And I feel like the old ways of training up staff where, oh, you know, you'll pick it up over the next couple of years. You'll follow this guy around. He'll show you what to do. That doesn't work anymore. Um, I wonder, I know your organization sort of helps companies in this space a lot. Mm -hmm. What is new? What is exciting? What should people be aware of? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the challenges you mentioned are all true. Our customers or clients are seeing, like you mentioned, high absenteeism, particularly from COVID, um, you know, sort of age of the average median worker is, is increasing and therefore there's a retirement, um, challenge. And what I would say is, um, employers and particularly manufacturers have had to inherit and take on more and more responsibility for technical training. So um, that sort of nexus of challenges is creating a, an environment where it's really difficult to maintain a qualified workforce. Um, and from our perspective, and I think a lot of um, you know manufacturers that we work with, the biggest challenge is uh, the, in addition to that, the skills that are required in a modern manufacturing uh, shop floor are evolving. So what does that actually look like on the shop floor for these manufacturers? Yeah, so a big thing that uh, that we're seeing, and again, it's either with Covalent, our solution, or, or otherwise, is um, uh, really involving a lot of different stakeholders in training. So you have SMEs who are, um, you know, who are, have been working on the same process for 10 years. You also have professional technical trainers. Um, you have um, a variety of outside consultants coming in. You have new technologies coming in. Um, and so being able to blend and sort of coordinate all of those different actions uh, in, a, in a really meaningful way, in a structured way, allows companies uh, to um, really understand like what are their skills gaps and what do they need to do to fill them. Um, so it's all about coordinating a lot of these uh, training and workflow efforts, business processes, and then using that data to apply it to hey, where should we invest more in training a new hire? Where should we improve our training for specific roles or occupations? Um, and, and, and again, that starts with getting granular enough around who knows how to do what and how to get trained to do what. And I have to think, as I've tried to envision this, I mean, I, I put myself through university in a factory many years ago, and there was a three-ring binder that they put in front of me, and sure. they flipped through, and here's the operator's manual of this machine. And what, It's nothing like that anymore. It's got to be getting away from paper. It's going to be uh, digital that can be pulled in a couple of different ways. Can we talk about the technology piece of this? Yeah, sure. So I think um, a big reason to digitize what we would think of as on-the-job training is exactly what, we, what I just mentioned, which is you want to be able to put that data into the context of the operation. When it's offline, when it's a paper form, when it's an Excel spreadsheet that's a training matrix, you have um, a lack of uh, connectivity of the data of who, who can do what, who's been trained on what. So when you digitize it and use a system to actually structure that data, you can start to apply it to actual operational use cases. Um, otherwise, it's gonna sit in a filing cabinet or it's gonna get uploaded to a legacy database and sort of sit there and not be usable. So I would say the big innovation in the past five, six years is not only digitizing for the operator to be able to train through, you know, very specific work instructions or whatever the case is, but it's also to take that data on how far along they are, how proficient they are with a bunch of blended learning and experiential learning and say, okay, this person is now capable of doing the following five jobs, you know, related to this process. And I can imagine it's not only more thoroughly making sure they're ready for it, but they're also doing it a little faster, perhaps with uh, less resources from, you know, you don't have to pull an experienced person off the line to right. coach this person through it. Um, when you've helped companies do this, like, is there a timeline for getting something like this up and running? Is it fairly uh, involved or, or is it fairly turnkey? Like, walk us through the implementation. Yeah, so for us, um, we really look at it from a... Um, operation and role level. So we start and say, hey, what are the roles that are applied to the operation that we're implementing for? You know, what are the jobs and, and work that needs to get done? 
And then what are the variety of qualifications, skills um, that could be mapped to that work? So I would say our typical site level implementation with a large site is under 30 days. Um, a lot of it is automated, but we also have a services arm that helps, uh, I'll say, manufacturing leaders, but also sort of shop floor leaders think through you know, the process with which people are getting trained and how high fidelity the data will be if they you know, uh, build it one way versus build it a different way. So it's more of a consultative work in, those in that month or so. Um, ensuring that the data that we're collecting from offline is being transported to an online version, uh, those types of activities. So I'd say it's it's highly, it's pretty intense for a short period of time and then uh, very iterative once the once our system's up and running. Right. People can make changes. I also try to think about um, the pain point because a lot of the time it's, it's people go looking for a solution when they're like, there has to be a better way. Most people, if I were to say, you know, are you happy with your training program? They're like, it could be better. What is the tipping point where they say we really do need to reevaluate what we're doing, reinvent things, maybe invest in in a solution like this? Yeah, so we, we see it from a few different places, I'll say. Um, one is on the quality and compliance side. So when we work in regulated industries in particular, there are requirements for making sure that only trained personnel are doing specific things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have an immutable audit trail of how someone was trained before they're starting a work order or buying off on a job, um, that's a compliance risk. So we hear that a lot from aerospace and defense, um, you know, a variety of other industries. But the other one I would say is when, as we were mentioned before, absenteeism is high, turnover, tacit knowledge is walking out the door, they're seeing productivity drops because they have untrained, unqualified or improficient personnel taking on jobs they're not trained to do. Um, and they don't have visibility into how they should evolve their program to improve productivity. So we're hearing that from the operations side of the house as well. So both of those are, are, are where we, again, hear the most from prospective clients. What makes Covalent Network a leader in this space? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think there's a lot of great you know, solutions out there that are doing different things. For us, I think what makes us particularly unique is we're hyper-focused on mapping training to operations. So um, all of our objectives, which is what we call our sort of core training object for operators to, to go through, are mapped to operational context around processes, materials, uh, workstations. And what that allows us to do is um, leverage the data for real-time visibility into who can do what. And I would say for our customers, which are typically sort of large enterprise discrete manufacturers, aerospace, automotive, it's critical to empower frontline leaders to use this data for workforce, um, which they typically haven't had in the past. And a learning management system that isn't really designed for the shop floor, isn't really designed for operations, isn't really capable of structuring the data in the way that would be actually usable for a frontline leader, for an operator, for a quality manager, et cetera. Is there something you're working on that you're really excited about right now? There is. Um, so, uh, as I just mentioned, our, our goal is to effectively bridge the gap between workforce data and operations. We call it workforce operations, for lack of a better term. Um, and one of the applications of this that we heard from our customers over the last few years has been, how do you apply this data to pre-shift task assignment and during shift task assignment? If you know who's capable of doing what, who's performing well in what specific task, and you know the job priorities going in, can a frontline supervisor say, hey, what are the ideal people to work on this, this job, this job, and this job based on my priorities to optimize productivity for my shift? So we spent about a year of research with a variety of partners in aerospace and automotive. Um, we actually built out a tool that we launched last month, um, and it's driven, driving all that data around workforce operations and job priorities through a machine learning algorithm and actually empowering the supervisor to make data-driven decisions on who should work where. What a great tool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that really fills a, one of those challenges that people don't even know it's a challenge. They just think it's a headache they've got to deal with as a leader. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we were a little nervous when we started developing this and, and getting feedback from supervisors that we didn't want um, it to feel like we were sort of replacing uh, any of their tacit knowledge that they've built over years and years. Um, but what we found was we were saving them so much time and giving them control of the ultimate decision on who should work where after the recommendations get driven that they're thrilled about it. 
Um, and so we're really excited to launch that to empower them, uh, but also hopefully optimize productivity for this workforce asset that has historically been under uh, under scrutinized in terms of how it's used on a shift by shift basis. Well, I love that you brought up that point because whenever we get talking about a, a technology that's helping people, I actually want to take a minute and talk about the people part of this. This is sure. changing people's day to day. There are those uh, frontline managers and uh, you know maybe plant level managers who a huge part of their task has been making sure their workforce is prepared to do the job. This tool is going to come in and change how they do that. What is their day to day like? How are they engaging with the tool? What what is uh, after they've got this up and running? What are they free to do now? Like, let's talk about some benefits. Yeah, sure. So I'll start with the frontline leader, um, and this is really the the research that we did in advance of building this tool. Um, if you think about what the decision making process is, if you're a supervisor that runs a area of thirty people, um, has a lot of different work orders, a lot of variability of what gets done in the shop floor every shift, you're making a set of highly complicated decisions. And anytime someone's absent, anytime there's variability, like a material doesn't show up and you have to make a change, you're ha there's a huge cognitive load pre-shift to make sure, hey, uh, this person didn't show up, so who should fill that gap? What's the domino effect? Because I need to move another person into this role. Um, and that can take up to 30, 40 minutes pre-shift. They're con consistently doing that through the shift. And so if you think about what a supervisor really should be doing and what they're excited to do, at least from our, from what we've heard, is coach up um, their operators, um, you know, work on professional development for their operators, help troubleshoot challenges on, on the floor, um, really take that managerial and personnel manager role seriously versus doing a highly data-oriented decision-making task, um, which, you know, frankly is uh, better suited for uh, an algorithm to do. Could we talk a little bit about the work relationship with Covalent? Um, so if I, as you say, it's an automotive plant or an aerospace facility and uh, you know we're bringing in this tool, is it you know your people come in, teach my people how to use it and leave? Is it an ongoing relationship? You mentioned there are iterative yeah. improvements. What does that look like? What is the working relationship like? Sure, yeah. Um, so we think of our product and our service as integrated, right? Um, so our product is designed to be scalable, configurable. Um, but every operation is different. So we have an implementation period, which I mentioned earlier, for our technical training tool, for our intelligent work allocation tool, which is our new one, um, that we really spend time figuring That wouldn't work very well. Andrew, we've covered a lot of ground in this conversation. If we wanted to highlight a couple of things that people should be thinking about further, what would you want to focus on? Sure. Um, so I, I think one thing in particular, and this is a little bit broader than just what Covalent does, is um, I think in our industry and in manufacturing in particular, um, there's, a, there's an onus to empower the new workforce. And I think um, in order to do that, um, what's really important, especially for the front line, is um, to ensure that there's structure and sort of oversight and strategy around how they get ramped up and trained. Um, and I think from that perspective, the closer we can tie it to operational success, um, the more likely incentives will be aligned to empower the workforce. So from our perspective, those two, two things are um, aligned, um, not at odds with one another. Um, and that's how I think about how we have tried to approach the, the problem set. For people who have been listening to this and you know are thinking about their own facilities and have some questions, want to learn more, what is the best way to get in touch? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'd encourage everyone to take a look at our website. Um, it's uh, covalentnetworks.com. Um, there's a lot of information on there. There's uh, demos, um, which you don't have to talk to anyone. You can just play around in our product, which is, I always think, pretty helpful. Um, and if you want to reach out to us directly, um, you can get in touch by emailing sales at covalentnetworks.com. Well, I encourage everybody to visit that website. I always appreciate when a website has uh, demos that you can walk through and then there's a way to follow up with specific questions. So that's, that's wonderful. Andrew, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to another episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint Podcast Series. I've been Jeff Mix. Let's do it again soon.